Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Sunday for Sunday, January 29th, 2023. We've got members of the media, academia, financial services, and government standing by as we analyze all the news and events for the week. So sit back, relax. Enjoy this episode of BRN Sunday. But if you're tired of the same old story, Well, we're going to kick things off with a look at what's happening on Capitol Hill. Joining me now to discuss uh, legislation, litigation, regulation, and a lot more, David Levine. He's a principal at Karoom Law. That's an employee benefits law firm based in Washington, D.C. He's also one half of the famed Legal Eagles. David, thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Jeff, it's great to be here. I hope everybody's had a good first month of the year. Yeah, and, and, and it's it's funny how time flies, but here we are one month in. I'm going to say one month into Secure. David, there's already, I don't know, scuttlebutt or conversations happen, conversations happening around some technical corrections. You and uh, your colleague Kevin Walsh are right in the uh, thick of things. What can you tell us? It's interesting, Jeff. You don't pass a bill that has 90-plus provisions on retirement without finding bumps. People worked on this hard for the last two years years yep. david i think you uh did you lose me can you hear me jeff oh shoot yeah i can, can you hear, hear i now? can hear you now let me uh, uh let me let me do the again, yeah let time. me call you right back because i, I want to get a fresh tape all right that sounds good bye, bye. That's frustrating. If it's not one thing, it's another. Can you hear me now, Jack? I, I can hear you just fine. Okay, here we go. Right, Sorry about starting. that. Three? No, no, it was my fault. Three? Yeah, it was. you kind of cut out. Three, two, one. We're going to kick off the show with a look at what's happening on Capitol Hill in terms of legislation, litigation, regulation. And there is a lot going on in the first month of 2023. Joining me on the line to discuss and break it down, David Levine is a principal with Groom Law Group, an employee benefits law firm based in Washington, D.C. And he is also one half of the famed Legal Eagles. David, thanks so much for joining us this morning on the program. Jeff, thank you for having me, and I hope everybody's had a good first month of the year. It's hard to believe it's flown by. It, it, it literally, and in, in, in the, uh, the great metaphor, because you are one thank half you. of the legal eagles. We're, I'm certainly missing Kevin this week, but um, David, let's talk about some of the conversations that have been happening this week about some technical corrections. You and uh, you and Kevin hinted at this when we had you on Secure Saturday and uh, in previous episodes of, of Beer and Sunday. What can you tell us? What's the latest? Sure. Absolutely, Jeff. And I think it's important to keep in mind, when you pass a large bill, you've had staff who've worked very hard on it on Capitol Hill for two years, and there was a lot of effort, but it's 90-plus provisions. Inevitably, perfection is almost impossible to attain. There's always going to be questions, hiccups, challenges, and it's nobody's fault. And Secure 2.0 certainly fits in that world. So you're seeing a lot whether it's in press reports, in trade groups, in our, when we talk to clients, when we, when we go out and engage with regulators, that we're, where people are saying, well, how do we deal with this and that? So given that at this moment, and th- that is a challenge that we're facing at this point. What I'm going to do today, and I think our, my fellow Eagle, Mr. Walsh, has joined us, is I'm going to hit one or two basic things on potential technical items and then toss it to Kevin because I'm sure he has a few more. So let's let's jump on in. The one that's gotten the most visibility in the last week, very clearly, is the discussion on catch-up contributions. There was a report put out on catch-up contributions saying that because 402 G1C, you know, talk about wonky in English, <laughs> the elective deferral portion 
of uh, the sort of the deferral limits where you can put in a certain amount of your own money every year uh, was wiped out by Secure 2.0. That part is true. That was the provision that talked about how you could do catch up contributions uh, and with it and how it related to the limits that normally apply to deferrals or Roth contributions. However, Congress put a lot of other stuff on catch ups in. They have they, they made catch ups, as people know, a special increased catch up limits between 60 and 63 and the requirement that in 2023, uh, sorry, 2024, all catch up contributions be Roth. Those two things highlight the fact that Congress did not intend to kill off catch ups. And you can read 414V, the 414V1A, sorry, I'm getting wonky today, um, or V1 maybe. Uh, that basically says, sorry, Jeff, that basically says, you know, the, the following types of applicable plans can do catch ups. We've had bumps before. And yes, well, I wholeheartedly agree. Legislative clarification would be great. To me, the practical on this is that you can look at 414V, say it still applies. If the IRS says, yeah, of course it applies and we'll wait for Congress to do the technicals, that gives us a path forward. Because right now, while there's interest in technical corrections and information being gathered, one of the challenges is there was a lot of energy put into retirement. Right now, I think there's bigger focuses, not no offense to our industry, that are being looked at, such as, I don't know, the debt ceiling and, and things like that. And that's going to be a, a, a big road and a big focus for a while here for obvious reasons. There's also one other sort of thing. There's many other things that I think that can be mentioned on it. On this, but there's one that I'm going to grab and then see, Kevin, if you want to add anything else, which is on required minimum distributions, the sort of formerly 70 and a half, used to be 72, age 73 this year. One of the challenges is the, the required beginning date moved up to age 73 from 72, effective now. But everybody's computer systems are programmed to say, if you're turning 72 in 2023, you got to start taking money. That's something that it can't turn on a dime. Thankfully, the IRS gave us good transition relief in 2020 that allowed special rules for people to still process until they got their systems in line with the new rules that tried to protect people, give them a chance to move money back around that wasn't RMD but wasn't classified as one. In English, the IRS gave a really good piece of guidance and solution. The hope is, and I would not be surprised, that the IRS gives us the same type of guidance this time around. That way, people who right now may have distributions treated as taxable required minimum distributions might have a chance to just roll that money back into an IRA and keep it tax deferred for another year. That was a lot of words and a little bit of technical speak today, or maybe a lot of technical speak. What I'm going to do is hand it over to my friend, Mr. Walsh, because I'm glad to see he has joined us. Anything you'd like to add, Kevin? Well, he might need to take himself off mute. There he is. Items that require technical correction, uh, you know, and, you hit on most of the, the ones that aren't super wonky. So I just, I'm going to reinforce that at the RMD age one. And it just provides a practical example. And essentially, you know, as David said, you know, there's a, there's language that says, you know, if you're 73, you've got to start getting RMDs and it bumps up to 75 and you get RMDs. And it creates this, this weird spot where if you were born in 1959, and I know this is, this isn't every listener, not everyone on this who's listening today is born in 1959. Um, but for folks born in 1959, um, you know, the law as it's written today says you've got to start beginning RMDs twice. And that's, you know, that's that's kind of a, a an odd setting. Um, you know, David, I think you did a key point, which is I don't think that that they want to spend a lot of time on retirement. This Congress, um, you hit on debt ceiling. I think another thing we should recognize is that, you know, Senator Sanders, the chairperson of the health committee, um, has signaled that he's very interested in health care. Um, so that, you know, retirement and health tend to go, you know, not hand in hand, but the same folks who work on retirement tend to work on health. Um, so I would expect that, that resources that could be pulled into, you know, making 2023 active on the retirement front uh, at the legislative level will be used on the, the, the health care front. And that leaves us, you know, focusing on, you know, seeing if they can do a technical correction package and then working with regulators to, you know, make sure the provisions work, even if the language isn't perfect. Guys, how long do technical corrections take? I mean, this is something that will be done in February. Is it something that you have to get it on the agenda? What 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 is the timing around that? Typically, well, well, that's the challenge, Jeff. You need to find a vehicle, just like Secure One and Two got attached to big omnibus bills. Mm-hmm. 
you have to find a place. So sometimes if people are looking for bipartisan agreement, maybe you could get it through the normal sort of order. And the Republicans, and Kevin, I'm sure has a comment on this, have said they want to go back to normal order, but we'll see where it goes. What do you think, Mr. Walsh? Yeah, I don't, I don't think you need an omnibus to make technical corrections. Um, but I, I think the key here is that making sure that all the senators agree these are technical corrections. So one issue that we tend to have, and you know, we saw it with Secure, was that it didn't move by unanimous consent. If you have something and it can move by unanimous consent, then you know, by God, the Senate policies, procedures, they're not really that big an obstacle because if everyone agrees and everybody agrees to move quickly, the Senate can clear stuff fast. Um, so technical corrections can move more frequently through unanimous consent because really you're not trying to change policy. You're not trying to change things people have voted on. You're just trying to clean up the law. That being said, you know, if any one senator raises concerns or wants to make sure they take a closer look at, at what's included in the technical correction package and, you know, devils in the details of what constitutes a technical correction, um, then you're back in the world that David was describing where, you know, you do need to find a, a bill to be attached to. Um, you know, since this bill likely is not as big as Secure 2.0, it's cleanup. I don't think we would need to wait for an omnibus year-end spending bill, but you need to find some other piece of legislation that's moving uh, and attach it to that bill. And and last question, I mean, is that where government relations people come in and they're reminding, you know, is it kind of Secure 2.0 all over again where you're kind of advocating for these corrections with the right staffers on the Hill to make sure that this gets included. So we kind of back to square one when it comes to that. Well, so I think they're aware of a lot of the things that don't work. I mean, the idea that people born in 1959 have to start RMDs twice. Um, I mean, that's yeah. clearly just busted language. Yeah. Uh, there's other there's other provisions where cross references were just mangled. And we, are, we didn't talk about those today because it's not particularly interesting to say that, you hey, know, and the cross hey, reference is supposed to be Kevin, here. Kevin, Kevin, I'm going to go for the more positive inadvertently mistakenly re- referenced not mangled <laughs> that's true thank you thank you david good good call but um so I, I think the staffers are aware of some of these and then i mean then there will be you know groups coming in and saying what you really meant to do in 2022 was fix x y or z and for some reason the legislation didn't do that and to some extent it's going to be talking to staffers about whether that's a technical correction or really if you're asking for something they didn't quite do in 2022 Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting, and I'm glad we have you guys to kind of break that down for us. David Levine, Kevin Walsh, thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning, and we look forward to having you back on the program again next week. Thank you, Jeff. Bye, guys. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, listeners. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Imagine... A new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house 
and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. Now we're going to take a trip and spin around the market. Joining us on the line, he's the lead anchor for the TD Ameritrade Network, Oliver Rennick. Oliver, great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this week. Absolutely, Jeff. Thanks, as always. Uh, so, Oliver, um, let's start with your general assessment, overall assessment of the market. Here we are almost the first month of 2023. It's really hard to believe. Almost over. That's right. Markets are repairing themselves in 2023. Pretty amazing degree of strength that stocks have shown as we've gotten some degree of inverse action compared to the past year. So basically the biggest losers of the past year have now been some of the biggest winners. That's part of the story as the market is thinking about the Fed slowing its rate hikes down to 25 basis points, so a little less aggression from the central bank and the assumption that um, that'll be the case now going forward is certainly helping uh, the market. But there's a few other interesting things beyond just central bank speculation happening here, and that's an important distinction because in the previous bear market rallies of the last year, they all essentially were pretty fixed and kind of binary on the notion that, that the Fed was going to reverse or cut rates or do something dramatic that they had not said they were going to do. Now, there's some of that still today where the market is being a bit unreasonable in its expectations for rate cuts later on in the year. But at least the market and the Fed are both in agreement that they are likely to pause their hiking program after these next two 25 basis point increments. And so that is uh, helpful to risk sentiment because it at least kind of puts the sunset within sight for the Fed's tightening. Now, that's not to say that inflation risks are over. Uh, it's more just to say that inflation risk has subsided. And so potential surprise and central bank antagonism to sink markets and apply a lot of pressure is probably slowing. Now, with that said, at the same time, the market's expectation of cuts later this year presents a potential mismatch between what the Fed has told us, and that could be a problem. But in the short term, the market and the Fed – both aligning on 25 basis points and then a pause, and then also evidence from earnings and stock breadth that is expanding that uh, is pretty compelling from sort of a logical standpoint of how markets are trading that a lot of this deterioration in these fundamentals had already been priced in through the bear market of the past year. Uh, and that's an important thing to realize because there could be a um, deeper recession that will really destroy earnings further. But until it's really, really obvious that's happening, the market is trying to take a pretty positive note in shrugging off declining sales in just about every major uh, industry in the in, in the tech industry in particular. And so to me, uh, it's a little bit of a different, more arguably reasonable style of bounce than we've gotten in other instances the past year. Oliver, uh, a lot of talk out of Washington, D.C. about the debt ceiling. What, if any, impact would that have or does that have on the market? I, and we lived through the pandemic, uh, all that money that was sloshing around, and we're kind of living through the result of that. But what does this debt ceiling 
talk mean for markets or does it mean nothing for markets? I don't think it means much because it's something that happens over and over again um, and it never has turned into like a uh, um, systemic issue. Um, to me, it's more something that's like confined to the political realm jockeying of politicians. Um, now, I mean, there's obviously financial aspects to it, but it's just not what has driven the market um, really ever before. And until something really uh, drastically new happens, then it won't be a driver right now. Oliver, when you look at sectors of the economy, are there sectors or sectors? Yeah, sectors of the of the economy. Are there certain sectors that are in your mind are doing better than others? We've seen layoffs, uh, for example, on Amazon Meta. You've talked about the technology drop off, but and energy doing well, for example. Um, where, where, where are investors putting their money? Right now, the industries that have been strong and reliably strong are generally connected to consumer services, travel, hospitality, and leisure, because that's where there is still this sort of post-COVID revenge travel happening. Um, there is also a good degree of strength in defense style industrial names um, as we are still spending uh, quite a bit on defense regardless who's running Washington. Those are the sectors that have been uh, reliably trading near highs. One of the things that's also pretty interesting though about this particular uh, bear market rally, if you will, is that there are also some companies in beaten down sectors like the chip makers that are doing fairly well. Like you have on semiconductor trading near highs. Um, you also have certain COVID winners like Chewy um, that are doing quite well over the past year and uh, fairly stable. So all of these things suggest the market is being a little bit more discerning uh, and aware of um, what's good and what's bad. You know, there are companies like Bed Bath & Beyond, they're mm. crashing still and doing pretty poorly, even after people try to pump up some of these speculative meme stock style names uh, earlier this year, that didn't really get very far. So there is some evidence that uh, investors are a bit more confident here. Well, I can certainly vouch for Chewy. Uh, my, logical. Yeah, uh, I can certainly vouch for Chewy. My my wonderful cat, Sebastian, is a beneficiary of Chewy and uh, to the tune of $120 a month for his <laughs> prescription. Yes, and now Donald, too. And Thanks now, for the it, recommendation. Yeah, well, you know, that it, it, is, it is amazing to be able to to you know get a script and to have it delivered and they do a they do a great job and they're not even a sponsor of the program i just think they do a great job so oliver we're going to have to leave it there i uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of the weekend and we'll talk to you again next week my friend all right thanks jeff thanks bye-bye and that wraps up this episode of brn sunday have a topic of interest someone you think we should talk to drop us a line and don't forget for all the latest curated news and lifestyle wellness finance tech so much more all in one place check out today's edition of our daily newsletter the morning pulse want to search our archives check out our latest content we'll visit our website and of course all of our streaming partners we're back again tomorrow for another edition of brn am until then i'm jeff snyder stay safe keep on saving and don't forget roll with the changes